Okay, ladies and gentlemen, thank you for coming back. Uh, I should have actually said, I, I promised and I didn't do it, so um, that on me for, um, we should have done the trivia question, which you have on your tables. Uh, so here's uh, trivia question number one that you need to answer. Uh, if everyone on Earth lived like the average Australian, how many planet Earths would be needed to sustain the population? So we need to answer that. There's a A, B, C, or D. And um, the other, one of the other questions is, which of the following species is most likely to become extinct without humans? Is it um, domestic dogs, pandas, head lice, all of the above, or none of the above? So there you go. Now, ladies and gentlemen, in this second half, we're going, we, we, if you got a little bit depressed uh, with the first half, thinking about how bad we are as a species, um, it's okay, the second half will make the case for humanity. Why it is that um, the planet needs us. Um, so if you were driven to drink by the first half, you will no doubt drink to celebrate the second half. Or why it is that, um, sorry? That what is that we have, um, why it is that humanity is... Um, it's valuable, but you're right. Fiona here is going to take this mic off me, and uh, we're going to take questions. So, uh, could you put your hands up, please, if you have a question? <laughs> Any questions? The bartender. Jack, at the bar. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> um, I know you guys were talking before about um, obviously the, sub the subject is why do why are we needed in the environment? But is there any particular culture or? race that has more impact, like I know there's obviously the westernised cultures such as, you know, the superpowers of the world, etc, etc, but are there other cultures that, like, if we, if we all live like, for example, like nomads, then w would we even have an impact, or is it just like the industrial revolution, all that sort of stuff that's, I suppose, developed us to do all this stuff to the environment, if you know what I'm saying? I don't, don't know how to phrase it probably. I had what I was going to say before. I've kind no, of that, was a, that was a really good question. Like, who's got the most brownie points when it comes to, you know, living? And I think you're right there. I think there's a, there's a point. Stephen, you want to take a question? Well, the first point is that this planet couldn't possibly sustain um, six billion plus people living like hunter-gatherers. Not even nearly. Um, but yeah, um, would there be more biodiversity, absolutely. Living as hunter-gatherers, you are certainly going to have much, much, much less impact. But you're saying hunter-gatherers in the sense that it couldn't sustain us, why? Because what, it's not as productive? Um, you know, it, it varies a lot with, um, you know, hunter-gatherer is a, is, a, is a broad term, um, but essentially it's going to vary a lot with habitat, with the communities that, that human uh, hunter-gatherer groups are living within. But um, in terms of population density, no hunter-gatherer uh, community um, has it ever come close to where the sorts of densities that we're talking about. So what you're saying is humans. we need modern technology, you know, whether it's... Um... Yeah, with, without it, uh, the sort of population numbers and densities that, that modern humans have achieved is absolutely... Uh, impossible. Right, so, so large-scale farming, um, you know, uh, transport to deliver food stuffs to cities where people are. Uh, these, these, you might think that humans have massive footprints, but actually they have a lower footprint perhaps than the average hunter-gatherer. Well, no, no, the reverse. Uh, indirectly, we are, uh, in a Western society, we have we have massive footprints. We, um, the thing is that this, if we're all living like hunter-gatherers, most of us would be dead. We wouldn't be here, is the point. Because of the, the, the planet we, can't, we couldn't can't possibly hunt. sustain this many people because the overall productivity would be much lower. I see. Vastly lower. Yeah, like, um, if you wanted to feed, feed your family just from, just a, like a, from your garden, like a, you know, a, your, a, a veggie garden, like in you know, a quarter acre block, you should have enough uh, lands there to be able to feed feed your family. I would have thought pretty comfortably. Certainly, 
yeah, with some chooks and, and it had been a bit boring, but you could do it, um, I would have thought. Um, whereas if you were... Um, but even if you're a hunter, gathering. Yeah, that's right, that's right. That's, that's agriculture. And of the, the, the first big thing that sort of um, meant that people could, more people could live on the planet was agriculture, this idea that we can collect seeds and plant them and, and, and we can sort of control where our food comes from. Um, and so, you know, like at less than a quarter acre block before people, I reckon you could get away with that. But imagine if you didn't have any agriculture and you just had to look for bush tucker. Like, um, how, how much of an area would you need to search through to be able to guarantee that if you've got enough food for four people? It's a much larger area than your quarter acre block. And so they just, you just, there's just no way we could get anywhere near the six billion. It's, yeah. well, well, just the, um, the example that you're, you're saying, quarter acre block, that's farming. Um, if you had to hunt wild, um, you're saying that that's not productive enough. So, but don't we hunt wild when it comes to fish? We, we don't have, we, we have intensive farming of agriculture and probably a whole bunch of animals like, you know, production of beef and pigs and whatever, or pork and whatever else. But that's not the case when it comes to fishing, is it? And fish stocks are <laughs> declining so fast it's not funny. And, and in terms of providing um, food to the overall population, it's still a tiny proportion. And increasingly, fish that we're eating is farmed. I, I, I don't know the actual numbers, but it's certainly a, a, a rapidly increasing proportion. And the, and the stuff that they're getting wild, they're getting it a lot further from home. Like I've seen some pretty scary plots of sort of where people go for uh, for fishing, sort of, and how it's changed over the last fifty odd years. And it used to be sort of, you know, this far from home, then that far from home, then that far from home, and now there's only these kind of little gaps where people aren't going, sort of, pretty much to to look for fish. So, and now there's like a Spanish fishing fleet in the Antarctic seas, so they're very far from home. And what do they do at siesta? Um, do we have any other questions? Uh, just behind you, Fiona. Um, yes, if not all the humans were wiped out by, say, an asteroid or something, I think the Earth would carry on with a different ecosystem. So doesn't that mean that our only real concern for biodiversity is how much it helps us? Like, I don't think there's really an abstract moral concern, as some of you have suggested? Um, well, moral or spiritual um, or economic, yeah, but you're right. Well, it is a matter of perspective. Um, uh, you know, evolution's only got uh, one trajectory and, and there's only one currency of success at, at the species level, and that is how much um, the DNA can you push forward to the next generation? Um, this this debate, yeah, it's it's you know it's 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 um, centered around humans and how it meant, uh, what it matters to us. Um, and yes, you can certainly make the argument. Asteroids have hit this planet before, as I'm sure you know. Uh, uh, Bolides have hit this planet before and wiped out big percentages of, of life. You could certainly make the argument that um, major extinctions can be a good thing, depending on, on, on what you're calling good, because from a major extinction comes renewal. Um, and and uh, so, yeah, I would agree with you at some level. It's, it, it is kind of all about us. Um, and whether or not you think... Um, Preserving uh, biodiversity is a good thing. Um, it, it is a, a moral or, or spiritual issue you know, for the for the individual. I think most individuals would would think that it is a good thing at a moral level and a spiritual level. And I think, you know, as Scott was saying, there are powerful economic arguments as well. <coughs> Madam, you have a different point of view, do you? You think that um, it's all a bit overblown, is it? <laughs> I was just putting forward my view to be discussed. Okay. Do we have any other questions? Uh, sir, just around the back there, and then we'll go to that. Um, thank you. Um, I'd just like to ask um, if we're not here contemplating these questions, who's there to decide the morality of, of species extinction, whether that's good or bad? I mean, we can only say it's worse or good, bad or indifferent because there's a, a contemplating part of the universe com contemplating about itself. So if we're not there, then what, 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 what is that? What, what is the question? Yeah, 
Yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I agree with that. Like a lot of what we're talking about today, it's all value judgments, and and it's value judgments by people. Um, and um, uh, when we're talking about would, would the earth be better off without us, what do we mean by better, and 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 who's who's making the call about whether it's better or not? Because even if we decide on what we mean by better, um, something that's we might think is better, or a tree might not think is better. I mean, if you go out and ask a tree what it thinks, like what the main issues for the tree are, it's going to just be whinging about the fungi, the bloody fungi, just cannot stand the fungi, Jesus. And those sap-sucking insects, oh my God, don't get me started on the sap-suckers. Um, you know, that's so it's a completely different set of issues from one species to the next. And, you know, they, you know there'd be a lot of species out there which just could not care less about humans and just don't, just do whatever you want, we don't care. Um, yeah, that, maybe that won't be true in sort of 100 years' time under some pretty, pretty bad sort of climate change scenarios. But, but you know, there's, it's, it's, it's uh, but at the moment, certainly, I, I think you, you can say that there's a lot of species that just, just wouldn't care less about us and just, just go drink two beers and talk about something else. Sort of. but, but, but they can't think about us because the tree has no brain. And, well, and yeah, obviously. <laughs> <laughs> So you're saying, are you saying, sir, that who would be there to write a sonnet about the sunset were it not for humans? Um, who would be there to make a value judgment about how bad we are or good we are if it wasn't there for humans? So we're kind of part of the equation, are we not? Absolutely, that's exactly what I'm saying. See, gentlemen, I have a, I have a yeah, downside. I totally agree. We, we are part of the question, and the question wouldn't be here without us. That doesn't mean we shouldn't try and answer it. And it comes down to whether you think morality only exists in the lens of human beings or whether there is some inherent truism about the way the universe works that we've hit on with this concept of morality. Or in fact, whether, again, I'm going to go way cliche, who knows that there's not some aliens out there watching this planet going, you know, those humans, they're not doing well. I'm going to turn up and punish them if they don't get it right. You know? There could be other people out there with their own morality judging how we behave. But then again, just on this issue of what do we mean by better, these aliens might be out there going, look at these humans. Jeez, they're awesome. They're everywhere. Like, they're, they're living on the ice and they're living in deserts. Jesus, these guys are awesome. And look how many of them there are. I mean, you know, so it depends on what you mean by better. Um, you could argue that humans are awesome. They probably wouldn't be saying Jesus, they'd be saying Zobro. <laughs> Zobro! Isn't that fantastic? Sir, you have a question? Yeah, I don't think I've ever seen a panel better qualified to uh, at least have a stab at this question. Um, just on sustainability, what is, in your opinion, the maximum population that human ingenuity can sustain on Earth? And what's going to happen when it all falls over? Uh, well, th th that depends on... Uh, what standard of living and how you define standard of living um, you want each individual um, to to attain within that system there's there's um, little doubt at the moment that the planet could take um, you know considerably more certainly billions more um, than it has now depending on um, uh, factors like climate change um, but the, yeah, the real the real question is at what level of material um, advantage. So if we if we decide that living like a hunter gatherer is good, the the maximum sustainable level is way less than we've got now. If you know, if, if living in a box is okay and you can just pump the human full of the necessary nutrients to keep them alive, so that they can. Um, one way or another procreate and push their DNA through to the next generation, I would suggest, you know, uh, many billions more than we've got now. So basically the question is, um, we're projected to have something like nine billion people in 2050. Um, if the question is, are they living like Indians yeah. today or are they living like Australians today? Well, that has a serious impact, doesn't it? It's inconceivable that they could live like Australians today. That's, that's and they probably couldn't even live like most Indians. Do. You're not talking about, you know, beaches and stuff. You're talking about, like, how much we consume. No, no, uh, definitely less than one overseas international holiday a year. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Uh, do we have any other questions? From the floor. No, we don't. We do? 
We do? No, we don't. We do? No, we don't. Okay. Bring it back to me. <laughs> okay. Well, that's triggered a bit of a discussion. I, I sense... I sense the case for humanity is coming from the floor. People are saying, hold on. You know, there are some things that we do. And let me put to you... Let me put to this panel. Um, you know, what about the the Tasmanian devil, if it weren't for us trying to save it uh, from its facial tumour, nobody else would, it would disappear. So that's one element of biodiversity that we're helping out with. Surely the case for humanity ain't all that bad, is it? Sorry, okay. Um, yeah, I, I think that yeah, there are some species which we're making a big effort for and, and I think on balance it's, there's probably a lot more that are hurting from us than, than benefiting. But just a, 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 a minor point on the Tasmanian devil thing. Um, uh, as, as I understand it, a lot of the spread of this of this facial thing is happening by sort of coming across um, dead animals by the side of the road, and like they sort of you, you, um, and, and just sort of you know, um, eat, eating on carcasses that already already sort of have the have the like um, yeah have have the disease, and because um, it's a transmissible cancer, isn't it? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, but. Um, if it wouldn't take very long um, until you wouldn't be able to see roads, um, and there would, and, and I mean, um, oh, but, but even, even without the sort of thing of are there, are there roads, like the, the idea of roadkill. If there's no people, there's no roadkill, and so like this, this sort of um, one of the the forms of transmission is is, is gone altogether. So it's it's not it's not a clear cut case that if you took away pet devils, Tasmanian took away people, Tasmanian devils are going to go worse. They might actually go better. I don't know, Dave. But I think you've been a bit harsh on humans Maybe because so to put this in perspective. Yeah. Um, until um, sometime within the last three to, to, to uh, eight thousand years, Tasmanian devils were right across Australasia, um, and arguably humans were responsible for that initial dec uh, much greater decimation of the population. Now, don't get me wrong; I'm, I'm not convinced either way on that, but. Humans arrived in Australia you know, sometime between around 40 and, and or sometime before 40,000 years ago. Um, and at that point, devils were um, right across this continent. And uh, it's my understanding that they've had this facial disease in the past and survived it without humans to, yep. to nurse them through. Yep. So this is a reoccurrence of something that's happened in the past it's as detrimental as it is now because of us. So in fact, if you want to put a moral imperative on it, it's our job to save them because they're dying. What is with these guys? Not with the program. We're defending humanity in the second half. Okay, I'm yeah, going to take the like Don't the forget the humans. fox. We brought the fox there. Humans <laughs> brought the fox to Tasmania, and that is a serious uh, further complicated. I think these guys could be yeah. drinking the kettle no, tonight. <laughs> no, I think, yeah, I think we're getting hung up on that example, but there certainly are lots of cases where humans are sort of making a big effort. Like Northern Hairy Nose Wombat, that would be, that's, it's in all sorts of trouble as is, but if, if you took away people, it's, it's gone. Okay, guys. Yeah, but again, we put it there. Yeah, that's right. That's right. We, we, put, we put a lot of these things in trouble, but we are sort of, yeah, you know, we're trying, and there's, there's sort of a lot of examples where people are sort of, trying and if we took people out of the equation then a lot of things would thank you david yeah. of course there's the cute and cuddly ones again yeah <laughs> thank you david. Well, i don't think anyone, anyone could accuse a of a wombat man but it's not that it's not that well, they're cute they're cute yeah. i don't think anyone could accuse a tasmanian devil of being uh, cute have you ever seen one up close oh, you ever no. seen oh, i think they're beautiful <laughs> yeah as long as not scratching your face out and they're, they're great when they're young you know you, people can pat them and everything's uh, great when they're young, young. even yeah. humans <laughs> um i'm going to take the, the lady's point about the asteroid uh when it, larry niven who's a science fiction writer said many years ago a very very prescient point about this he said that um the reason the dinosaurs died out is they didn't have a space program yeah. And it's true. You know, if ever an asteroid was heading towards the Earth, who the hell is going to save species on this planet? It's going to have to be good old humans. That's right, Homo sapiens sapiens. They would be the ones that would actually have an impact. I mean, we are the ones that stand between total calamity, uh, you know, a, a mass extinction event, or, uh, and, uh, you know, wiping out a whole range of species. But it's not just that. It's um, 
Okay, you could argue that in climate change we're having a dramatic impact, but Steve, you've argued that this sort of stuff has happened before and it's happened way worse than this before. Um, Give us time. So, uh, sorry? Give us time. We've only been around for a couple hundred years. <laughs> So, um, you know, is there an argument here that humans actually can... I mean, it's self-interest in the case of an asteroid, it's self-interest. Yeah, look, look uh, this was a Scott, uh, uh, point, sorry, Scott, that we were discussing before. And, and yeah, um, a massive bolide impact is, is arguably the most catastrophic thing that could occur, um, certainly in the near term. Um, and I, I would totally agree, and in fact, I would have liked to have made the same point. Um, only humans can stop it, um, and and these are potentially things that we are t where we are talking truly catastrophic. A big enough bolide hits, and everything. <coughs> now we probably couldn't stop that if it happened next week, but certainly uh, it's a realistic expectation that within the next 10, 20, 100 years, which in, t in geological time is nothing, that human technology will be the stage where we, we could well, stop. Well, actually, in, in astronomical terms, as so long as we keep an eye on the skies, this is one of the arguments for astronomy, by the way, um, we see these objects um, within a few years of them hitting. Most cases, unless they're really obscure objects that do, you know, 100 million years um, orbits. But most of the time we see this stuff way before it comes, and we'll have a few years, or at the, at the very least, uh, you know, at the very least a few years, um, notice these guys are coming, which allows us to, even with current to, technology... To send up Bruce Willis. To send up Bruce Willis, <laughs> um, Can I to not blow it up. By the way, um, it's, it's inaccurate to think they blow it up. The blow it up you don't want to do, because that just makes multiplies the problem. What you want to do is just nudge it out of the way, so this is the Earth. I think we have a, a gentleman who has a question. Just to add to that, but... Can we just... Give to the mic. Just, just adding to that uh, topic of discussion. But are we really trying to save the species when uh, Armageddon hits us? We're really just trying to protect ourselves, right? Yeah. I mean, I don't think the astronaut up there is going. Uh, we're doing this for the koalas. Yeah, but I, I, I don't. You, I agree totally. But it's it's uh, it's not the intent, the individual intent there that's so important. If we're talking about saving biodiversity, um, whether or not the, the the man on the ground or on the on the asteroid um, is thinking about saving biodiversity or not is not really the point. The point is by his actions and the actions of those that are backing him up, he will have done it. And there is nothing um, more, that, certainly that I can think of, um, that would be more catastrophic or is potentially more catastrophic, aside from the, the, the fact that our sun is going to um, run out of fuel in about 5,000 years, uh, uh, rapidly expand and, and blow the crap out of us. And again, only humans... Don't scare the hell out of people. 5 billion, please, 5 billion. But, but, well, this is another point that I'd like to make, that humans... Um, life will end on this planet, because this planet will end sooner or... Well, well, more likely later, but it will happen. This planet will be gone. Um, it's possible that this is the only planet with life. Um, I, I don't subscribe to that notion. I, I think the numbers are against it, but it, it, it's certainly the only planet that we know has life, and it's certainly the only planet that we know has, has intelligent life. Um, only humans, at this point in time, can spread life, as we know it, anywhere else. Um, and it, it may well be that, you know, and I'm not saying it will happen, but certainly it's conceivable that humans will spread to other, other solar systems. Um, and in doing so, we're likely to take other um, uh, bits of our current biodiversity with us. But even if we don't, we will at least spread life. There you go, sir. We wouldn't be doing it, I, I take your point, is mor the moral question is, well, would we be doing it for all species or would we be doing it for ourselves? But the point is, at, if something's coming out, coming to hit us, uh, we suddenly realised our, our uh, brotherhood with all species <laughs> and we defend it because it's in our interests. And that's the problem, I mean, it's not the problem just, it's not an exclusive problem with humans, is it, that we do what's in our interest? Every species on the planet 
does, what's in their interest. Oh, there is actually no altruism among other species, is there? Uh, arguably there is certainly altruism, but, but uh, not with respect to, to consciously, not with respect to consciously um, um, preserving other species, no. But um, just getting back to the original question about intent and um, the, the original point about intent and, and it's not if humans just do something to save themselves and, and indirectly save other people, then that's not such a good thing. If you use that argument the other way around, most of the extinctions that are going on, like most of the problems around the world um, with, with, with biodiversity because of humans aren't because people said, all right, let's just go make a species extinct. I mean, that's not what they were trying to do. And so you turn that argument around. People didn't, sure, we made all these things extinct, but we didn't need to do We, we didn't mean to do it. Um, you know, so it is, that's, that's actually a good loophole to get, us, to get us out of trouble on this one. Thank and, you, David. And it might Thank actually, you. It might Thank actually you. work in a court of law. Just, I've just cleaning it all went off. Things saying, I, 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 I did, sure I did it, but I didn't mean to do it. And yeah, David, yeah, the yeah, pro problem is ignorance is no defence. <laughs> However, <laughs> However <laughs> the point is, intent was not part of it. Two, is what two you're points saying. there. One is that uh, arguably even humans are not altruistic. That all the altruistic things we do, we do in a view of increasing our own fitness. The How same cool as any other species. Say that. And two is, we're now in a position where we know what we're doing, that we know we're impacting on species, and we don't change our behaviour. No other species on Earth would knowingly drive other species that it relies on, for example, extinct, or knowingly uh, wipe out. But you don't know that. But they, 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 they don't know. So we can't say it's not a, a conscious. We can't say that they wouldn't. We well, they are could, knowingly they could, doing it. They couldn't do it. Maybe. So maybe. But, but to be knowledgeable about what you're doing, and doing it anyway is a very sad testimony to humanity, in my view. Yeah, I'd argue that we're not doing nothing. I mean, maybe we're not doing enough or as much as you'd want to, but there's certainly a lot of people out there doing something. And like all the national parks, for example, and the, the sort of marine reserves that are set up everywhere around around the world, like they're all, you know, there's a lot of them around the place specifically for the purpose of trying to preserve um, sort of uh, endangered species. So you know, it's not like we're sitting around doing nothing. Maybe we're not doing enough, but you know, there's people out there trying. Okay, Scotty, you're arguing humans are bad. This them. Let's remove humans from the equation. Let's, you know, some kind of virus breaks out. All humans wipe out, are wiped out. Okay, and the planet will be happy with. You, you would argue perhaps the planet would be happy with that. But you know, humans have a lot of carbon in their bodies, and if you have six billion humans die and they release that carbon in the atmosphere, don't you get a massive carbon spike that then leads to the methane bubbles at the bottom of the ocean to bubble up, and suddenly you get runaway global warming, and basically the whole planet is screwed anyway. Well, there's more carbon in the permafrost than in all human beings on Earth, and that's melting because of us, so you, you wouldn't have that happen, I don't think, but um, look, end of the day, uh, Whatever we do to the Earth, things will survive. We're not capable of wiping out everything on Earth, even if we set our minds to wiping out every other thing on Earth. So, end of the day, Earth will perpetuate life long after we're gone. And as a species, I don't see us being the kind that's going to survive like crocodiles for hundreds of millions of years. We're too stupid. We don't, we don't look after ourselves in the way that would allow us to continue to survive. No, no, I'm going to disagree. Go, go in there, Steve. I'm, I'm, go I in there. To defend humanity. I have to. Well, I, 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 I'm not necessarily defending humanity. It's just that to me, um, you know, when the worst happens, there will be cockroaches, rats, and humans left. And there are a lot of ecological based arguments for uh, sustaining that, I think. You know, uh, humans are incredibly diverse. Uh, oh, sorry. Uh, Occupy a really large range of areas. Um, in every ecology, every, ecology, every issues, continent, even the uninhabited continent. You mean like in ecology? ecology we, in uh, terms of ecology, of uh, humans among large mammals um, certainly no, nothing else comes close. Just in in terms of the numbers, the distribution. Um, one one of the most uh, the, the factors that lend species or, or renders species most susceptible to extinction is low population numbers. The, the other most obvious is um, 
a, a, a narrow uh, distribution in terms of area. Humans are everywhere. Um, our numbers are massive, and we can take out 99.99% of our species, and we are still, um, would still be a relatively successful large mammal. Just hold on there, we're not planning to take out 99 Just so you know, Scott, we're not planning to take out 99% of species, but were it to happen, we can come back from that. In fact, we, were, we faced that situation, did we not? Uh, it's estimated that 70,000 to 100,000 years ago, we faced a, a bottleneck in our, in our species where um, it was, it was at um, it's a volcanic eruption. Mount Toba yeah, uh, Southeast Asia, yeah. in, in, in Asia blew up and um, basically darkened the skies. And when we were a species that was focused in one area, which was the... Uh, well, well, I don't know about one area, but certainly more restricted. Um, and, and the population um, esti estimates there are down to the thousands. Um, and yet we rebounded from that without the advantage of, of technologies. Um, you know, bottom line is, I, I don't think humans could wipe themselves out unless we engineer a massive uh, bolide impact that I, I blows the planet apart. The now, reason... life might not be worth living, <laughs> and we might not like it, but we're not going to wipe ourselves out. Obviously, the reason we did so well at that time is that humans, by and large, were adapted to survival. Now, humans by and large are adapted to comfort and letting other people look after them. So unless the 1.01% 1 .01 who survive are the survivalists in the state with their machine guns uh, and outdoor survival skills, the average person wouldn't survive. If you cut off the power and the food supply, the average person would not survive. Um, well, sorry, I mean, if, if one in a hundred, or one in a thousand of them survived, if one in a million of them survived, you'd still have a lot of humans. Yeah, um, I guess I, I guess just going a different direction on, on, on this argument, um, well, we started off with climate change and, and we sort of moved off in a different direction. And I, I don't actually agree with this idea that sort of climate change isn't, like the, the only thing that's gonna get us is some humongous comet. There's a lot of uncertainty out there and climate change sort of scenarios like range from very bad to catastrophic and, and we, we just generally don't know how much damage we can inadvertently do. Um, to, to the climate system and so I, I, don't, I don't actually think we're going to wipe everything out just by putting a, a, the climate into some sort of um, in, into some sort of runaway sort of uh, disaster scenario it's not, I mean, and most people don't think that's going to happen but um, I don't think you can confidently rule that sort of thing out. Um, yeah, but, but so, sorry David, are you talking about complete extinction of our species? What sort of climate change would we need to wipe out humanity? Uh, making it uninhabitable, just like, um, I don't know, say 10, 15, 20 degree increase in temperature would, would be, would, would, would make, would push us, wouldn't it? <laughs> well, 10 degrees, we've been there before. Um, so, uh, we've come close. That's the thing, I mean, we've, we've, well, you know, when you talk uh, about... 15, I'm not sure, I'm, I'm not sure. When you talk you're about... Talking, you're talking... No. Yeah, that's right. But we don't we don't know what like uh, the sort of things we're doing to the climate and the rate we're doing it at. We don't know what is going to happen, no, and what could happen, yeah. and so it is. There's uh, this a uh, huge range of things that could actually happen. And I guess I guess just sort of thing, looking at things from the point of view of a statistician, there's you know there's a lot of uncertainty um, there. I mean, when apparently when people are 100 percent sure about something, they're right about 70 odd percent of the time. So. Um, yeah, you know, we, we really, we really just um, don't know where it's going to go, and and so I, I wouldn't sort of d dismiss that as something which which could sort of wipe out wipe out everything on the planet. And following from that, I mean, you, you look at our two nearest celestial neighbours, Mars and Venus, both of which are within a habitable band from the sun, could support life. You've got a different gas concentration in the atmosphere; nothing survives. You can change the gas concentration in the atmosphere. And we are doing that on a large scale. Wouldn't take much. To change that gas concentration to a level where you work us out. In fact, that's the. I'm, I'm sorry, there are very, very different things. Uh, you know, Mars and Venus are very, very different planets, uh, and, and they're a lot smaller for a star. Uh, Venus, it's nearly the exact same size. Well, 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 it's a, sorry. Well, it's smaller, but but it's but it's a lot closer to the sun. There's a, you know, it, it's. Um, look, 
It's 500 but, degrees, and yeah. it should be basically Earth temperature. Similar gas concentration, Venus would be basically Earth temperature. It's sort of unfair. It's carbon however. dioxide that makes it 500 degrees. Yes, it is. It is. And yeah. in fact, the, the a surprising thing I discovered recently was that um, the reason we found out about carbon, the carbon dioxide's impact in, the, in our in, in our Earth was by trying to understand the chemistry of Venus's atmosphere, and then we realised that CO2 was responsible for the green, you know, a runaway greenhouse effect, and that the same sort of thing could potentially happen on Earth, not not quite to that extent, but that CO2, a trace gas, could actually cause that, and that freaked people out. Those are the 50s, 60s, and 70s. Um, so I know what you mean by. You've been, a, you've been a little bit unfair. I think that's a little bit unfair. Oh, it's deliberately a little bit unfair. But, yes. but look, the reality is, whether we're talking, um, the reality is, um, within the sort of parameters we're talking about, if we lost 5% of the human population in a short period of time, we would consider that catastrophic. I would consider it catastrophic, especially if it was me. But the, the, <laughs> the fact is, um, those sorts of numbers are entirely believable and that is way bad enough. Uh, we don't have to talk about uh, Armageddon here for it to be really scary. It, it is scary anyway. You know, if, if we're talking about 30 million people, 100 million people, 500 million people dying of starvation and uh, displacement. But that's the thing, I mean, our barriers, that, that is scary. Our, our markers of what we consider catastrophic are quite different when it applies to species, right? So when it comes to human species, catastrophic is 5%, 3%, 2%. When it comes to, you know, oh, well, you know, the sun so species down by 50%, you know, we're still going to maintain some, aren't we? We're going to maintain oh, half. I, I, look, I think the chances of us wiping our souls out are minuscule. But I would absolutely accept, totally, that, that we could easily push into an area where, and look, we're all pulling numbers out of our backsides here at some point. <laughs> and anyone, I'm glad we're here and anyone anyway. who talks about it is, right? But but um, it, it's way conceivable that we could be talking, you know, five, ten percent of, of the human population being displaced for a start. But even even if you go down to the not quite the extreme of ninety nine point nine, but I, I would suggest everyone in this room would suggest that if we were to lose 50 or 70 percent of the human population because of climate change or some other loss of bees or whatever it might be some sort of catastrophic change we lose society basically we lose the standard of living we have today we're back to hunter-gatherer society i think everyone would agree that's basically the end of human society as we know that's that's a catastrophic change and that's certainly within the capabilities of humans to create totally, totally that agree. kind of change totally so even if we would we, come we might back, disagree. there would be new society 99.9 be new civilization. yeah we, no. we might survive it some tiny fraction and 2,000, 3,000 years down the road we might be back to where we are but that doesn't do us any good no. right now the people no. in this room doesn't do us any good our descendants doesn't do them any good no. so uh, you know now well, 1,000 years down the track it might actually be good for our descendants I don't know and, and that's, certainly that's a long time without cable TV guys I mean you know go easy I oh, certainly have to kill myself if we lost that cable TV, so you know, <laughs> that's an extra one person down. Um, okay, we're going to take uh, the last lot of questions before we do the raffle draw. Um, Fiona, would you like to take the microphone from my hands? I seem to be surgically attached to it. Do we have any questions? We've got the gentleman here. Many plants love having extra carbon dioxide up to a thousand parts per um, million. Uh, most plants use considerably less water in their transpiration. A lot of the water used in transpiration is in the quest to get CO2 out of the atmosphere. So maybe humans are also there to recycle some of that carbon from the coal that's been buried from um, warmer climes in eons gone by. Apart from the obvious one there of deflecting a bolide or breaking it up. So what do you think of that, that we're here also partly to recycle that carbon to make plants' life a little bit easier? Actually, but there's certainly an argument, even, even now, that... Um, look, there will be winners and losers, depending on how bad it is, right? Um, if, the, if average temperatures go up by half a, de a degree a degree, um, there will be countries in this world, and certainly areas, that benefit. Um, if you're living in Siberia, 
um, a couple of degrees or a degree increase in average temperature is probably going to be good. Um, it's just that the way societies and humanity is configured geographically at the moment is for a, um, a world at more or less this temperature. So changing it, I'm sorry, I'm spinning off your question, but I've had three beers, so. <laughs> this science have more. Have more. Yeah. I, I guess um, one reason why people tend to be pretty negative about the prospects of, of uh, biodiversity under different climate change scenarios is, is, is the rate of change that's happening. Like, um, uh, it, maybe somewhere will become warmer and, and nicer to live in, but um, it's, it, it's occurring at, at uh, quite a fast rate, and I, we, there's a lot of uncertainty about what rates have happened in the geological record, but certainly, if at the moment, if, if like our species has to move sort of 300 kilometres in the next sort of, um, I don't know, uh, 20 years, and its, and, its, and its seed dispersal distance is like this far, and it, um, you know, it's kind of, you know, there's, there's a lot of species where, like, um, uh, they're going to have to move a long way uh, quite quickly if they're going to um, live in the same sort of climate that they're in now. And there's also a lot more species which just have nowhere to go living on top of a mountain and they need to be sort of, you know, higher off the mountain. Um, so um, the, the rate, like, the, the rate is, is sort of, is considered to be sort of a, a key issue in, in, in sort of why there's, there's um, um, a lot of concern about a lot of species. As uh, I think one number is sort of um, somewhere between 30 and 50 percent of species um, over the next hundred years uh, are not going to be able to find the, their current climate within their existing range. So they're either going to have to adapt or move or, or, or go extinct. And the faster it happens, the less likely it is that they'll be able to adapt or move. Yeah, and one last point, I think, for the individual plant that lives in the middle of its home range, he's happy. Got more carbon, he can grow all he likes. But for that species as a whole, all those plants on the edge of the home range that as the temperature goes up, can't survive, they're all gonna die. Uh, whether or not that species can move at the same pace that climate's changing is questionable. So sure, if I'm an individual tree, I'm in the middle, great, carbon goes up, I'm, I'm happy, I'm growing better, but even for that species and for species as a whole, that's not gonna be a positive outcome. I think an interesting point to make is that um, while you can argue that there will be um, winners and losers from climate change, you know, there'll be, you know, Vladimir Putin, who's the Prime Minister of Russia right now, is really quite happy about climate change. He thinks that, great, there are whole tracts of his country that will suddenly, will be able to grow plants and will be able to grow crops, and he's quite happy with that. Not so they're about the fires, though. Not so happy about the fires. Well, that comes with the part of the equation, doesn't it? We know. Be, you know, economies to trade with. But the, that, that, there's a problem, I agree. Um, but, you know, so there are winners and losers in climate change. There are not winners and losers when it comes to habitat destruction, are there? Well, well we win. No, we win in the short term at any rate because we destroy habitat to farm, to gain economic output. Okay, I'll give you an example. Uh, you know, a wonderful, well, wonderful, an, an unpleasant example of habitat of, of destruction we, t we discussed earlier was overfishing and the, um, the Atlantic cod off the coast of Nova Scotia farmed to the point where it actually cannot replenish itself and it's, uh, it's, the ecological system has collapsed and actually a whole range of other species are now taking over that niche. Now that, that um, the cod fisheries have gone basically. They, they were suspended in 1992 and they were hoping that maybe they'd come back in five or ten years and they've never come back. It's gone. Basically, the cod fisheries that used to exist off Nova Scotia, which were so, um, you know, so bountiful that you could drop a basket off the edge of your boat and pull up the cod, they're gone. So there are examples of where you can actually have losers that are permanent. Do you, oh, can you not? Absolutely. And, and, and extinction <laughs> is, is obviously, a, you know, just that scenario. Um, look, I... Well, climate change, you're saying climate change is not all that bad, but it's not all, uh, it's not, how is that destruction? Right? I don't think anyone here is saying climate change isn't that bad. It, 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 uh, I think certainly, well, I, I don't It's good and bad, but habitat that destruction is pretty bad. But I think so, certainly all three of us would agree climate change is bad. Well, well, Human-induced climate change is bad. Um, but, but despite this, you wouldn't have got any one of the fisher people who was fishing those species to stop prior to the end of that species, because up until that point, they were doing well out of it. Even if they saw it coming, 
they wouldn't have stopped. In fact, we probably did see it coming in. It happens many, many times. All the fisheries around the earth are strained. We know it's happening. We're not stopping because there's money to be made. And when there's money to be made, people go out and, and make it. And even the, the, the last guy who spends his million dollars to eat that last cod, he's going to do it with a smile on his face going, I ate the last cod. He's not going to think, oh, man, I just ate an extinct species. He's going to smile and say, oh, I was the guy who ate the last cod. Oh. We have a question um, in the back. Uh, Sorry, David, would you want to make a comment? Sorry, um, sir. We'll just have David finish off his comment and we'll come straight across to you. Sir. Sorry, mate, it's probably not even worth it. It was just a, a small comment about uh, habitat destruction. Like uh, you were suggesting that it, it's always losers. I'd, I'd say that there are winners and losers in most change scenarios and and there's certainly sort of winners out of some habitat destruction. Uh, well, I mean, humans, obviously, but like, I guess one I was thinking of is sort of just urban landscapes, like around Sydney. Um, there's there's all sorts of species that like living in urban landscapes. Um, noisy miners, um, for, for example, I don't think they're supposed to be around Sydney. I think they came from over the mountains or something. And, um, Maybe. Uh, no, oh, noisy uh, miners. Yeah, noisy miners, yeah, about natives, yes. But, but yeah, so the natives and there's yeah, the introduced as well. And rats. Yeah, yeah, so... Oh, in cities. It, yeah, so there's winners and losers in most things. And Sir, you have a question? Yes. So it's a pretty big what-if question, but um, if we get to the point where there's, say, like, one in one million people left, um, can we ever get to the kind of stage of, I guess, resource bounty that we find ourselves in now, or can the Earth just not regenerate fast enough to sort of sustain the way we kind of live our lives? Um... If I'm understanding your question correctly, personally, um, I think if we massively diminished our own population, um, yes, sooner or later we would be able to get back to the situation we're in. The question is, I suppose, um, do we want to do that <laughs> or would we want to do that? Yeah. yeah I, I, I don't think we'd learn. That's, that's oh, no, thing. I certainly okay. don't. <laughs> well, I, I think you're probably right. But, but perhaps if there was a precedent. Because there is, of course, no precedent for the situation we're in. Yeah. No precedent in what sense? You're sensing that one species dominates the world, the planet, so much that they're leading to extinction. Is that the precedent? Uh, well, that is true, but there's also certainly no precedent to the fact that uh, a, conscious, a, a conscious, intelligent species has, has been in this situation. We just... So it, could learn theoretically, it. we chance. could learn from it. Is is the point I'm making? I'm not saying I'm not suggesting that we that we would. I'm just saying that we could. I mean, but basically, it comes down to the lifestyle that we enjoy today in Australia would be sustainable globally with many, many fewer people. So if we all wanted to enjoy this kind of lifestyle, if we were prepared to say, you know, no children for anybody for the next generation or so get ourselves down to 100 million people, fine, you can have this lifestyle. If you, you knock the population down, we just reach the level and maintain it. We could all have a wonderful brain lifestyle without having huge impact. Scott, the numbers I've lifestyle seen, by population. The number I've seen is that uh, something like 200, 300 million people would be, you know, everyone could live like Australians and they'd be fine. That's a pretty depressing number. I, I'd vote to be in that. Yeah, that's, that's way too many Australians, you're right. <laughs> <laughs> so you have a question. Um, yeah, it's about incentives, because it's all, it's all about incentives, because uh, if people have, been sent, you have particular incentives uh, in terms of rewards which they're given, whether they're economic, social standing, then they'll behave in, in certain ways. And the example that you gave about cod fisheries, I mean, of course, an individual cod fisher is going to act in their, their best interest, which is to catch fish, even if that means taking the last fish, because they're not thinking in terms of the cod fishery, they're thinking in terms of the money they can make. And it's the classic tragedy of the commons, because they're thinking about themselves, not about the, the overall community. So, I mean, I, I'm just kind of asking if you can reflect on the, the economic and other incentives. I think it takes massive leadership and education to, but to, to it, leadership, leadership, get around that. Leadership, but it, I, leadership I, and education. I'm not optimistic that it'll happen. But, but leadership and education are nothing unless there are incentives, because unless people are rewarded for doing the right things. I mean, there's lots of education and incentives. But about, incentives, uh, incentives cost money, and that's got to come from somebody else. So you're going to have to politically take some serious risk. You're going to have to tax other people more. Well, to, in, in, incentives actually don't cost money. Incentives, when they work well, they're 
they they pay for themselves. They cost money, then they kind of they defeat themselves. What examples do you have in mind, sir, of incentives? You don't mean like a nice pat on the back for doing something, do you? You mean something else? Oh, it, it, um, it wouldn't hurt. <laughs> I'm always partial to a nice pat on the back. Um, if, if people are rewarded, and in our culture that's normally monetary, um, they'll they'll do whatever where, where, the, where the money goes. Uh, but it's not just about the money. Point is, that I was making it's, it's going to take money. money, and that what that requires, to my mind, is education and political will. So, in, uh, you know, if we're talking about, for example, uh, you know, fisheries, and we're going to tell uh, fisher folk that. We don't want them to fish anymore, right? Um, politically, basically, we're going to have to buy that. We're going to have to we're going to have to pay money, and that money has to come from somewhere else. And with the, that means we have to convince the other people who are paying for it that it's worth it. Okay, I'll, I'll give you an example. If if you've got a th thousands of individual fishers who are catching fish. They'll catch, they'll, eat, they'll catch the last fish because they've got no incentive not to fish because what they do has really little impact on the overall fishery. But if the whole fishery is controlled by one company, then they might over-exploit that resource through lack of knowledge, but they won't catch the last fish because they can see, well, they, can, they, can make, they won't make any money if they don't have any, any stock, stock left. Um, I, I wouldn't trust any big company not to do that um, <laughs> myself, but the, the, nor a big government, frankly. The, but but the, the, the alternative is proven time and time again yeah, to well, fail. The alternative is, is that the, the bottom line, the alternative is you pu push it to the edge. The reality is they may well push it to the edge, bank the money and move somewhere else. Move to another industry. Interesting question. Um, the argument, though, is it, it's interesting to see that the gentleman asking that question is you, Stephen. You're assuming that the only rewards are monetary. And I did mean the pat on the back seriously because uh, the charity industry would not exist were it not for the feeling, the non-economic feeling people have of doing good, you know, the altruism what, 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 You could argue it's evolutionary or cultural or whatever it is, but people, there are some things that people do that make them feel good even though there's no benefit I to them. I think that's where education is important. Educating people to think, to, well, it sounds like, like brainwashing, but, but educating people um, uh, on sub, with respect to um, offering them reasons why it might be important to maintain well. But sometimes it's not reasons, it's just making them feel good about it. It's interesting. Well, you've got to make that. Okay, but you've got to give them a reason. Well, the reason is uh, self interest. It, I'm just constantly baffled by humanity that can knowingly allow these things to happen. I mean, Easter Island's a wonderful example. They knowingly cut down the last tree that basically made their island uninhabitable. Knowingly, that would have happened. You knowingly, in many of these fisheries, we know they're, they're declining. Fishers continue to fish right up until the last possible instant, knowing that their industry is going to collapse. Without the self-interest to say, you know, if we slow down a little bit as an industry, a self-regulated industry, we can perpetuate this thing forever. No, let's fish it till the day it dies, and then we'll just find something else to do. That's that's a very short-sighted mindset for what are supposed to be the intelligent species on this planet. Yeah, I, I don't think we're unique in that, though. I think it's pretty common that um, organisms work in their self-interest, and I mean it's worked for them for you know four and a half billion years or whatever it They're is. not conscious. We are. If yeah. we're better than other species and we use our intelligence to justify the destruction of other species, surely we should be able to rise above that very base animal instinct. Well, that would be a pretty awesome achievement if we could do something which no other species on the planet can do. Yeah, um, we already can. We do um, lots of things. Like no species some, species. Something like this, sort of working against sort of base sort of self-interest. Um, um, I mean, I, that would be a pretty, pretty big achievement, but, but there are examples where we're already doing that, um, you could argue. Um, uh, the ozone layer, sort of the, the, the something that sort of a lot of people in the climate change debate sort of hold up as, as kind of this big sort of, um, achievement. Sort of uh, CFCs were threatening to sort of um, blow the, the whole in the ozone layer out of control, and 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 as 
um, quite early on, like quite relatively quickly, certainly compared to the action on, on sort of on fossil fuels, it was very quickly. Um, sort of uh, like uh, governments got together and, and sort of um, and worked out a plan of attack and and um, CFCs are, are, are I don't know if they're totally gone or if they're sort of nearly gone, but um, there's been a dramatic there's been a dramatic change and that's having sort of visible sort of effects on on sort of on the ozone layer and. and uh, and that is working against self-interest. Self-interest says just buy the cheapest sort of, um, you know, underarm deodorant, no matter what sort of is the propellant or whatever. And so, and so there are cases where we are doing this well, already. There's individual <coughs> self-interest, and then there's collective self-interest. Yeah, and, and I'll still argue that collective self-interest requires an overarching political uh, uh, leadership framework, and, and, and it requires education. People, have, people have to know why. So when people are talking about a carbon price, that's what you mean, isn't it? To actually um, provide disincentives to um, do the things that create um, the CO2 in the atmosphere and therefore lead to climate change. Yeah, sure. So you, you, it's a really good point, David, that you brought up. We've all forgotten about the climate change treaty, the international climate change treaty that really worked in the Montreal Protocol. It was very, very successful. Um, and I know there's a couple of Canadians here tonight, so well done, Canada. Uh, bringing that forward, um, and it is it, it, it has been successful. It's reduced the number of chlorofluorocarbons in the atmosphere, and we are seeing uh, a, a slow but gradual increase in the return of the ozone layer to where it once was. And uh, perhaps we could do the same with, with CO2s. Unfortunately, with the, in the case of CFCs, there was one particular industry, the chemical industry. Uh, in the case of, uh, so sorry, with the CFCs, in the case of CO2, there are a number of quite powerful industries, whether it's oil and gas or, um, you know, it's very hard to separate where CO2 um, is generated. It's everywhere. And it's a much harder problem politically to introduce it. However, that's why we need a carbon price. The, ar the argument for a carbon price is you make it expensive so that, you know, we do less of it. Kind of like tobacco taxes. Um, sorry, David. Yeah. Okay, yeah, sorry. So the original question about incentive, I think that was a really good one, and, and carbon prices is, is really sort of the main sort of way um, that we can use incentives to try and change change uh, practice um, with, uh, like, uh, in, in terms of the whole the climate change debate and how to get people off fossil fuels. Um, uh, and so I guess, the, so that's sort of, so there's, there is sort of a mechanism that we can use that, that, to, to make a, a difference um, for, for the big climate change uh, threat. But I guess the question is, how can we use incentives for the deforestation threat, like um, the habitat, habitat destruction, which is sort of this other sort of twin, twin threat to biodiversity, sort of what sort of incentives can we, can we give to sort of Brazilian um, farmers to stop sort of chopping down trees or whatever? Give them some money. And, and we've got the money, and it's, this is the other, the other big issue here, <coughs> is that we are effectively asking the second and third worlds to, to cover our debt. Um, or, or certainly that is what they would argue. We have burnt, most of the fossil fuel that has been burnt, um, you know, has been burnt by Western, most, most of the, the issue with respect to climate change at the moment it is the product of the Western world. Uh, See, the, rich, the rich countries. The rich countries, and we are now, uh, and of course, you know, the, the, the second and third world are alive to this, um, we're basically uh, increasingly telling them they can't have our standard of life um, because it'll be bad for everybody. Um, bottom, bottom line is, there has to be some quick pro quo, and, and this is recognised at, at the higher levels, of course, but, but it's, a, it's, a, it's going to be an ongoing issue. Because we're saying, hey, you know, hey, this CO2 stuff is not so good. You come off it a little bit, guys. And they're saying, hold on, you guys did it. It was fine. When you guys were doing it, how come it's bad now? So, you know, there's an issue. And, and methane, of course, is far worse than CO2. And there's a heck of a lot of that in most of the, the major um, political centres. Speak centers. for yourself. No, I'm not a political centre. <laughs> <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, we're going to have to wrap up tonight. But um, uh, could, uh, before, uh, firstly, can you thank my wonderful guests? Uh, it's been a fabulous discussion. Uh